Okay, so uh, we're going to try to talk about uh, well the symbolic execution of KEVM. Uh, KEVM already was a, a bit introduced by by Andre, and you've seen some some rules and actually some tweaks to to it. Um, but uh, well, you can sit down. It's it's <laughs> uh, okay. So uh, the idea uh, here is that. Uh, we have this uh, like very generic tool which helps us uh, prove properties about any language in general, uh, and uh, it also helps us do perform symbolic uh, execution in particular. However, the the tool is very com aims towards completeness, and uh, let's see, we have here. Oh no, okay, let's uh, let's start with the preliminaries. Uh, but yeah, I, I'll get back to that idea in a, in a moment. So okay, um, we you've heard a bit about the K framework, hopefully by now. Um, what uh, we're gonna talk more about is this part, this symbolic execution engine, which is called internally at least the Haskell backend, uh, and uh, the development of this Haskell backend is actually led by uh, Anna here. Uh, and yeah, okay, we also have some concrete execution engine that is good. It's actually reasonably fast. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, it generates uh, some uh, interpreters which are comparable to handwritten ones. It, it's very nice, okay. Uh, but uh, we are interested more into verifying things or trying to do symbolic execution, trying to analyze programs. And for that, we need something symbolic. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's why we're talking now more about the Haskell backend. And here are the current members of the Haskell backend team. Uh, and uh, Everett, who is our CTO, they uh, specifically helped uh, a lot during this uh, project, as I understand. Okay. So uh, this whole thing is uh, part of this move that we're trying to doing the company going towards a more modern K. And we're going to talk about, uh, about this. And uh, this part of modernizing K also kind of leads towards having a modern symbolic backend. And what do we mean by modern is that, OK, we, we have a symbolic backend, and it kind of works. OK, it is slow, but it uh, took a lot of time and effort to implement, and we learn like we've grown as a company we've learned from how it is uh, how it was implemented and now we think we can do better uh okay and uh, this novel approach to implementing a fast symbolic engine is uh, what the talk is about okay first a bit about what modern k is well this is all k uh now, what we have in, in the old uh, version of K, and specifically, uh, well, K is like this black box in some sense. Uh, you, you write a K specification, and then you have some tools. Uh, this uh, K front end, uh, which basically takes your specification and compiles it and transforms it into an internal language. And then from that internal language, you have either the concrete execution, which you run to verify your definition, basically you can run tests, you have an interpreter which you can uh, actually use. Uh, and uh, we have also the symbolic backend, which is more for running proofs and uh, doing symbolic exploration. Uh, and uh, the problem now is that, uh, yeah, uh, you people have to know K, okay, that, uh, that has been discussed uh, before. Uh, but uh, also the fact that this symbolic backend is opaque to users and somehow it's also opaque to, let's say, more proficient users. So it was just like this black box where you, you have to, uh, to kind of, you look at the output and try to think, okay, I don't know what went wrong, but, and I don't know where it went wrong. Uh, and yeah, uh, one very important factor was that it was too slow to even for us internally. Um, okay, now what uh, happened with this uh, modern K is that we, we have a, a package and uh, it's written in Python just for easiness of use, uh, which allows 
people to interact with K pro programmatically in the sense that you, you have these uh, interfaces where you can ask K to do certain things, like uh, an API. Uh, and the, so, so far, it, it explores only a small set of primitives. The thing that we've needed so far to be able to implement our own uh, strategy. So uh, the one thing about the old uh, symbolic execution engine is that it had one or two, and I think lately just one, predetermined strategies to how to find a proof how to explore the proof space and find a proof. And uh, we, we said, well, but there are a lot of other things that we can do. Maybe we want to do uh, model checking. Maybe we want to have a slightly different way to, to explore the proof space. Maybe we have optimizations to, uh, to, to implement on, on these proofs. And uh, uh, the, the, the main thing here is that, okay, we, everything uh, would have to go through the Haskell team. The Haskell team, okay, it's uh, it's good, very good, but there there are very few people. So you you kind of had a, uh, just how is this called uh, a node where every uh, if you take it out, the graph gets disconnected. I know it's me high here, uh, a critical node. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, so uh, the idea was that we want to make it better, and we want to make it such that people who have basically no case knowledge they could write their own strategies by understanding something about what symbolic execution means, something about how things can be uh, proved, just to use the infrastructure to, to do their own analysis tools. Okay, uh, part of this uh, is the KVM Foundry, which uh, Andre talked uh, about uh, earlier. This is implemented also, I think, using PyK, is it? Yes. And then there is also work in progress to, towards making k awesome, uh, using the same interface and k -mir. Okay. Okay, okay, so... Okay, so the... <laughs> This is interactive UI. Uh, so this part here, the, the, the engineer has to know some K right now, but potentially you can remove all requirement to know K because you can pretty print this back to Solid or so, to something which is familiar to the engineer. So. Okay, so basically this would be uh, some sort of front end on top of the, the existing guy. Yeah, I didn't explain that black box. <laughs> And another thing is that we can do this for any semantics, right? So this will be the, the only uh, part of the uh, implementation which is specific to semantics, while this is uh, language inter independent. Okay, yeah, so okay, if I, if I remember correctly from, well, from what uh, Anna just uh, said, yeah, so somehow the idea is that uh, we have this like K generic, but still with this Pi K, which allows you to do specific calls to the API of K, and then this part will be language specific, so you would have some interface developed specifically for EVM, some interface developed specifically for WASM, and so on and so forth. So somehow, if, if people want, they would go, they can go deeper, then they can go like to, to the K specification and so on, but for, for engineers, uh, like for, for simpler tasks, people would be able to do everything on, on this higher level. Thank you, Anna. Uh, okay, so the first step towards obtaining such a modern uh, symbolic backend. Uh, okay, well, we start from the old existing, well, from the existing uh, Haskell backend. Uh, and uh, yeah, this is online, it's, a, it's an open source project. It was designed from the beginning to be, let's say, as close to the foundations of K as possible. So it is designed to be to accept matching logic input and to be as faithful to, to a matching logic interpreter. Uh, an important design uh, choice from the beginning was that we wanted to be as complete as possible. And uh, because of that, uh, yes, 
performance had to give. But yeah, we want to say, okay, we will try to 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 solve all the possible problems. And yeah, probably because of these design choices, it it has grown uh, quite large. So this like 100. 50k lines of Haskell code, I think, puts it among the huge projects in the Haskell community. So I know it was uh, large even, uh, I don't know, about uh, seven years ago when I, when I still worked on, uh, on it. Uh, okay, and then uh, we, right now, uh, or at least until recently, the Haskell backend only consisted or only had uh, as interface to the user these two executables. So core exec, which was used for executing, like using the Haskell backend as an interpreter, and maybe something, a little bit of symbolic execution. And the core wrapper, oh, actually, no, no, okay. No, so core exec was the main thing to execute it, and core wrapper was kind of like, a, well, a wrapper, yeah? An interactive debugger, uh, fluid explorer, and so on. I core exec would just tell you yes, no, or give you a core dump if something fails. Uh, <laughs> big core dump, yes, yes. <laughs> uh, okay, and then uh, um, yeah, I don't know. Okay, monolithic pipeline architecture using a test space interface. I, I guess you can figure out what what this means. Um, but yeah, I think the most important thing is was that, okay, again, as I, well, we said, so this core exec will just say you yes or no. Uh, and it was hard, uh, like, okay, we would filter these results to uh, the front end and try to give better uh, output to the user, but things wouldn't go that well. And then the interactivity to the core Apple was kind of limited. Like you had only a limited of things. You couldn't implement strategies and uh, and other things like that. Okay, let's see. Um, now this is the new uh, new approach. So uh, basically, the kind of the Haskell backend, the architecture of the Haskell backend has uh, shifted, and uh, most importantly, uh, the, it provides uh, this RPC server, which exposes an API over JSON uh, RPC uh, towards users. Okay, and uh, of course one can interact directly with it, but uh, PyK is basically there to help and uh, to, to, do, to make this interaction a lot uh, easier uh, and to implement some, let's say, very desirable uh, properties. Uh, and yeah, some of the things that one can do with uh, by calling the RPC is uh, well, to execute, like to execute for a number of steps or to, to do one step of symbolic execution. To simplify an expression, I reduce it to just applying this, like the structure of the equational uh, axioms to, uh, to a term. And also an important part of the, well, of symbolic execution in general and of proving in particular is this idea of checking an implication. Like basically when you want to to see that, uh, well, an invariant holds, so you want to see that uh, you have reached the conclusion of the proof, you would always have to check an implication. Moreover, when you want to see that uh, the current configuration or current execution uh, configuration is still feasible, you would want to be able to check that uh, that thing also holds. Uh, and uh, yes, another thing here is that being like exposing this to users or exposing this to to people in general uh, allows them to be creative first, like do use them in any way they, they seem feasible, uh, but also um, you can implement something which is language specific right? because you you have your in on top of uh, using this you also have your language uh, knowledge. And you could uh, do all kind of uh, simplifications or all kind of exploration choices, implement tactics, I think. Uh, okay, so a bit about fast symbolic execution. So we, you've seen that right now it's like a new API, a new uh, way of, uh, of doing things where you could kind of ask specific things from the symbolic engine and uh, do your own thing with it. Now, how to how to make this fast? And uh, 
Well, to, uh, based on to the JSON representation, right? So how do you write configurations? Because in our configurations, we have this XML-like notation. You translate that into a JSON like notation? Yes, I think that's the. Uh, so instead of having thing, yeah. like, um, I don't know. Well, JSON, I think right now. You I have K colon and then the contents of the K. I think the front end can export, no? Right now. Yeah, it's, it's a representation of, uh, of, of core, like uh, the internal data structures, no? Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, and that, that has been for a while. So we, I think we had a, a JSON output. Uh, for for the Haskell backend for some time, I mean, it shouldn't be. So there are some requests in the past to drop completely the XML-like notation in K and to use the JSON-like notation instead. So instead of writing, you know, yeah. things like cells in XML, just say name, colon. And then no, context. so th this is not related. This is no, more related to like the representation of terms uh, in core. But in a in a JSON format, just to make it uh, so make I a know, distinction between parse. configuration cells and plus or minus or other things. And the I think also the important thing is that uh, these RPCs, these servers are let's say have tools which are know to deal with JSON uh, uh, much easier. So basically, and a lot of tools are uh, know how to export JSON. So no so parsing, no parsing in this tool. Uh, no, no, no. So yeah, that's, that's the thing. The, the, the important thing I think here is that. Uh, yeah, you don't want to to implement a parser for core, mm -hmm. or like someone using it to implement a parser for core, they would just take this JSON and, okay, if they need, they can look inside it and they can revert. Oh, definitely, it would be much slower to use a text-based representation because, yeah, again, these are optimized to handle JSON. Mm -hmm. so what, maybe we should adopt this JSON representation as core, you know, as the syntax of core and everything. Maybe, but it will be hard to read because I think right now it's just uh, even the application would be a different uh, row. Yeah, so the, the, I think Jason is more machine. I, because core is still, to some level, is still human readable, and people get used to it. But I think probably JSON would be. But well, I guess some people could get used to that as well. Yes. Okay. So. And now I think we're getting into things that I'm even less familiar with, but we'll see. So the idea is that, OK, we want to implement a fast symbolic engine, OK? But this should be done in a pretty generic way. So OK, we, we are allowed to take shortcuts, but we want to kind of try to take shortcuts which would work for all languages, if possible. Uh, and uh, the thing is that we st can still Whatever happens, we know that we have this the existing uh, symbolic backend, which, OK, we know that it's slow, but it works. So we can always go back to it. So if anything goes wrong, we revert to using the, the existing uh, uh, symbolic backend. OK, and then uh, the, the way that this, uh, this new uh, symbolic execution engine was developed was this idea of, uh, OK, like test-driven uh, development or conformance test de uh, development and even like employing some extreme programming uh, uh, concepts in the it says that okay let's not do implement feature just for the sake of features let's not try to make it as complete as the because we already have one which we it's let's say well maybe as complete as it can be or as complete as we could uh, make it here, the idea is that we, we want to maintain correctness, but we want to try to make it as simple as needed to make the things that we currently have or we can currently think of run fast. Right? Right. <laughs> okay. So uh, this is, for the moment, or at least uh, it's, a, it's a closed uh, source tool. Uh, the idea is that, okay, it's just a booster for the existing symbolic execution. Uh, 
And uh, it's nice, the fact that we have the existing symbolic uh, execution is that help us also build this tool incrementally. So we, we you always save that as a fail safe. You can develop new, new ideas, see how they run. If something doesn't work, work revert to the existing one. Um, and also part of this new K, modern K, is that trying to be more higher level, no? So instead, try to find out things which, let's say, make sense at the level of K, which is a bit higher level than the level of the matching logic. Because, yeah, the, the, again, as we said, so the first uh, Haskell backend was based, was built for matching logic. So it took matching logic as input, try to, to make it as complete as possible. But in some sense, one can think that K, it's uh, not everything that matching logic can do, or maybe let's uh, put it the other way. Not, uh, 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 so there are things in matching logic which probably would be very hard to express in K. No? So basically, if you try to make something which works very well for K specification and Moreover than that, it works very well for the regular K uh, uses, usages. That might be, let's say, a little bit more uh, efficient than trying to, to catch matching logic in its generality. And, and with, again, the fact that if you do have things like that, you still can uh, have a fail-safe the existing backend. Yes, OK. <laughs> uh, OK, and then uh, since uh, KEVM is probably, let's say, our mostly use semantics and we have a lot of tests for it and a lot of use cases then this was like the thing of choice for for the first uh, version of uh, first approach to this um and uh, okay it's always the risk of building something which will only work well for evm you now and like they uh, they try to counteract this by uh okay still thinking a bit from a higher point of view so trying to find, I don't know, what do you mean by, okay. Okay. Uh, okay, and then some, some key points here are that, okay, a large part of the execution has no branches. And one, if you, I don't know, if you ever played with symbolic execution, you know that there are two things about it which are like the harder things. No, the, the fact that you branch, so basically you have to split your configuration and go on different paths, and maybe the way you handle looks. Uh, and the fact that a, a large part of the execution does not branch kind of means that you could execute that with, let's say, less powerful symbolic engines. No, you, you don't need to, you, you only need to stop and consider and split configuration at the moment where you have a conditional, you have a, something which would branch. Uh, Okay, so that's one thing. Another thing that, well, it's, well, okay, this is hard to explain, but okay. Matching logic, matching logic uh, can express partiality, and partiality is a natural thing. However, in most cases, or in a lot of cases, in a lot of semantics, people actually want to avoid partiality. And if you consider EVM, for example, even division by zero, has a semantics is zero, okay? Just because they didn't want to care about exceptions and other things. So uh, because of that, and uh, yeah, in, in order to support partiality, uh, we have these checks for definers, for something that to check that something is defined in order to make sure that we can apply a rule and so on. Uh, this is, it, it is indeed very expensive. It has a lot of calls to, uh, like this implication check, it calls to the external SMT. Uh, and uh, it's something that we usually can do without for a lot of cases. So this was one of the key observation. Uh, another thing is that, well, there's something probably could be done for the backend in general, but it would be harder to implement. Uh, but we can, uh, and actually the LLVM backend has a very generic rule indexer uh, for uh, try to, to to find the best rule of fast, which applies to a configuration. But the one thing that, uh, that they noticed is that, well, our executions or our rules are most of the time, and I think for programming languages all the time, are guided by this K cell, which contains the 
computation, the current uh, program, the, the thing to be executed. So then you can almost all the time, just by looking at the first or the first two uh, elements in this, uh, in this case cell, you can figure out what is the next rule to be applied. And this actually, uh, I think, provided a big speed up to uh, the, uh, the booster. Uh, okay, and then, uh, yeah, also this thing, like uh, we, we have a very generic uh, unification algorithm in the old backend, uh, and okay, that works fine, uh, but in most cases, you don't need the generality of that. Uh, okay, and uh, well, I guess uh, there can be more things here, or some of this might not be as good. Yes. I think it is true for most semantics, I would say. But yeah, yeah, I guess for, uh, but yeah, the idea, I think here, the, the phrase here at the end says that, well, okay, maybe like referring to the overfitting, no? So, okay, maybe this don't necessarily hold for all the languages, all the definitions one can think of, but when we encounter one, let's say we can probably uh, figure out something to do about it. Okay, how are we time? I'm a lot over. Okay, how how many slides are there? Oh, okay, okay, so we're, we're kind of, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I, you, you just have to, I don't know, take into account that I know something about it, but not that much. Uh, okay, so um, yeah, this is part of uh, about Haskell in general. So uh, we had this effort of implementing the Haskell backend, which I think it's, I don't know, five years now, or maybe, or something like that. And as you've seen, it's, it's grown a lot. And I think at the beginning, the we were very keen on interesting new techniques like very abstract like implementing abstractions and abstractions are good but uh, they also kind of well they also make tend to make your program slower but not only that they also tend to make your programs harder to profile so one one key thing here is that okay if you try to keep your implementation simpler then it might be much easier to to reason about uh, performance. Uh, we actually part of this effort to try to make the backend uh, faster was we we actually hired some professionals, which were they that's what they do. They're just trying to optimize Haskell code. So uh, that's uh, something you you might want to check out. Uh, and uh, yeah, another interesting thing is that we. Well, we need simplification, but it, it turns out that also the LLVM backend, which is, okay, written uh, in, uh, well, it compiling, written in Rust, compiling to LLVM, has a lot of optimization. They also do in simplification already. So now you could just use that part of the simplification, their part of simplification, instead of the original Haskell backend, and still make it uh, a nice tool. Uh, and uh, yeah, well, I guess profile, profile, profile. Okay, okay, okay. Yes, yes, yes. Testing and profiling are very important. Uh, okay, so in conclusion, uh, well, it's still an open problem, but we've made steps towards it. We have this booster, at least uh, I think in the test so far, uh, the booster, it's uh, one or a third of magnitude faster than the at least. So okay, let's say it's still in the prototype phase, uh, but it's it's very promising, and uh, yeah, we'll look forward to when we can actually release it uh, to uh, to the public. 
Yeah. Okay. So it, 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 it when it does uh, when it will be released, it will be part of the key as a service, like pre helping people to run their specification faster, having this booster capability. Uh, yeah. Okay. So uh, let's say. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you, you, it's your, it's your talk, uh, and yeah, questions.